Church. It's uh, Kevin DeCorin, and I just want to um, wish you a Merry Christmas for those of you who are into the Christmas celebration. And for those of you who are not and um, are into other things, may your days be merry and bright. Anyway, I want to just get to, uh, to the point today. Um, today is Sunday. Uh, December 4th, 2016, and it's at 1.40 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, my, um, I have a couple videos out there that you probably sh uh, are have watched or uh, should be watching, uh, apart from this one. Uh, I, this is a continuation of 1 Peter, um, 1 Peter chapter 1 and 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, right now we're in 1 Peter 2. Uh, we've already done verses 1 through 12, and we want to jump into verses 13 through 25. Um, before I get into First Peter, I want to say a word of prayer, and um, and then just take it from there. All right? You already know what's going on with uh, my situation, my life. Um, Gabriel came out earlier today, and she sexually assaulted me. Uh, I think with a uh, with a dental, one of those dental things that you clean out teeth. They stuck it in my mouth, and on this side, uh, they stuck it in my tongue. So whenever I, I, I talk, it hurts. It hurts the tongue. Um, she molested me, uh, vaginal vaginal molestation, oral molestation, um, and the same piercings. The, the same thing, you know, repeated, 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 repeated every single day. And John MacArthur's behind it. Gabriel Franklin, John MacArthur, his daughter Melinda, um, I went to um, pretty much all night long they did it. Um, I have a card here with the church on it. Every time I walk into the apartment, um, I had this next to my uh, Christmas tree, and uh, they keep pulling it down and leaving it facing this way. So that's their hit. Um, I went to a church this morning. Um, what was the church? Uh, First Covenant Church. I think it was First Covenant Church. It's on um, probably 45th and Burnside um, I as soon as I walked in I was cut off um, let's see what else I didn't meet the church I have no idea who they were I didn't meet any of the pastors elders leaders uh, I used the restroom I came out and uh, there was a, a whole line of people in the back uh, right before I walked into the church they had a serpent a worm on the on the stairs <laughs> I was like, oh God, I hope this is your church and not the house of the devil. But anyway, um, <coughs> I was cut down several times. I was offered sex. Um, um, I was offered sex uh, diff through sign language. I think those people were probably weren't the church. They're probably unbelievers. They asked me like twice, and then they uh, finally told me no. And um, I walked out. Um, there are some. They dropped a couple hints, you know, here and there. Um, they made it obvious, so I figured after half an hour, um, a bunch of racial cutdowns, at least that's how I took it, because they were making um, references to African American sort of like spirit, attitude, and that, that sort of thing. Um, I didn't want to hear all of that. I came for the Word of God. I came for the fellowship of Christians. I didn't come to listen to a bunch of hissing Europeans, and um, that's what they were doing. Okay, and I and I have a feeling that MacArthur and the gay community was behind the whole thing, uh, and there probably was a switch of staff. So, for whatever it's worth, uh, if you are if if you are one of those congregations who embrace your 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 who embrace your people as a family and um, and you're into all of that, then probably the word of God is not for you, because if you understand God's word, there's a division between church and state. There's a division between um, God's family and the the racial divisions are outside of God's family, not inside of God's family. Um, inside of God's family, it's the scriptures and the and the word. I read a verse this morning. Uh, as a matter of fact, I read a verse not too long ago. I think it's coming from John 17, and um, in John 17, I think the scripture says, John 17:11 says, "And I am no more in the world, and yet they themselves." This is the Lord's priestly prayer. It says. And yet, um, this is his farewell prayer, it says, And yet, they themselves are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. You know, sometimes I hear the Catholic Church uh, talking to the priesthood and the cardinals calling them Holy Father. 
I think that's wrong to call a cardinal or the priesthood Holy Father when the Holy Father here in Scripture is making reference to our Heavenly Father. You know, I, I don't I don't agree with that. But anyway, Jesus says, um, Holy Father, keep them in, in thy name, the name which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are. See, the name that you the name that you have given me, that they may be one. We're supposed to as we are one. I think the whole aspect of the unity of of um of the church is supposed to be in Christ Jesus, right? Uh, call me crazy for saying that, but I think the unity of the church is supposed to be in the name of Jesus Christ, not the division of skin, hair, and eyes, which is what I, I felt like. Um, I felt out of place today. I felt like I wasn't in the church. I felt like I stepped into the wrong group. You know, you're like, oh my God, what am I doing here? You know, sort of like, you feel like, um, you know, why am I back here again? You know, I mean, it's like, you can feel it in the air. See, the name Jesus is the reason, not just for the season, but is, is, is this, this, right? The name Jesus here is, 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 it is, this is what he's talking about. This is the name that you have given me. And they're all supposed to be unified in that name. And a lot of Europeans are not unified in this name. They're unified in the name of being European or American or clan or gay. But in this name, they're not unified. They will not allow people who name this name, who believe this name, and who put themselves under this name as God and as Lord. You come into their houses and you're the enemy. And you're not united in this name. Right? They're like, what do you want? <laughs> because they're looking at your nappy hair, your dark skin, and they're going, uh, this is a European house? What are you doing here? And it's like, well, we came because of the name. What? We're supposed to be unified because of the name. Oh, well, this is our family, and you belong to our family, and we don't want you in our family, and blah, 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 family, right? And you're supposed to, to read it, and I, I, I don't understand these people. You know? I have this sign here, don't aggravate, it leads to death only. Anyway, let me just get to the point here this morning. Um, so when I go to church and I'm in your congregation, don't aggravate me. You know, I don't want to cuss you out and call your names so don't aggravate me i'm not gonna turn away from the from the body of christ or from the scriptures because you want to be a racist um it was interesting because i was sitting in a very i wasn't inside of the church i was outside in the lobby and i was sitting up against the, the, this window and they had this um bench in the back and uh and i looked and there was the lord in spirit i saw him in the spirit and he kept on motioning for me to leave and i'm like what and he kept on motioning for me to leave it was the weirdest thing and I thought, is that the Lord or is that just another op apparition? And he wouldn't come into the building, but I had to, I had to leave the building, and um, and, and I walked out, uh, past the bus stop, and went all the way to, um, oh, what is that? I think it's like 39, 39, not too, not too far away from the park that's in that area. And when I got there, um, across the street, the Lord stood. And church, I got to tell you, it's the, I've never seen that side of him. What he showed me in the spirit was so just, I, I, I won't say it on camera, but it was just like, that's not according to scripture. I'm not exactly sure why you're showing me that side of you, but that's not, that, that I can't be a whole, that can't be you in the spirit showing that to me. And I just walked away thinking, oh God, what have I gotten myself into with God in his, in his church? But I just dealt with the, what I thought was the church, and now I'm dealing with the Christ himself. And he's like, oh my God, what is this? You know, it's just the Americans coming out in the spirit and showing me their bad, their 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 um their elimination, or is this this can't be this can't be the Christ? What what is this? The elimination and what and the blood goes to your people and the elimination should go. I don't know. What what does that mean, church? What does it mean when a Messiah bends over and shows you the elimination coming out of his butt, and then it's like what is that? I was like I was so shocked by what I saw. I was just like something's not right here. Something's not right. Something's not right. Why? why you, you know, like how Spider-Man does this with the web. Okay, blood was coming out of his hand here, and shooting it toward the church, and it, it filled up the whole house. But his backside was lifted up, and what was coming out was the elimination. What is that? Who does that? Who in the church does that? That's not the Christ. It can't be the Christ. How could it be? What kind of sick m m mentality is that? What I just read to you in the scriptures. That's the Christ. That is the Christ right there. Be careful with what you see in the spirit. Do not believe every spirit. First John 4 says. First John 4 says, do not believe every spirit. 
because some spirits have gone out. You know, let me read it to you real quick here. First John 4 said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay, but now I'm telling you, I'm not talking about prophets, but when you see a spirit that comes to you in the form of the Christ and shows you the nail in his hands and the nail in his feet, and he starts doing some funky thing that you don't understand, don't automatically believe that's the Christ because you don't know. Weigh it with scripture. Make sure you balance it with the word of God and what the word of God has to say to you. You know, and if you don't understand what's going on, pray to the whole to the heavenly to the Holy Father. Like it says in John 17, 11. We better preach to the Holy Father because we're going to breeze through this real quick. We're not going to be talking for no two hours. That's just too much talk. Anyway, Father, thank you for this afternoon. I just want to breeze through this. Um, I ask you to forgive me, Lord, for my sin. As I read in the uh, um, in Isaiah or in the Psalms earlier, pray, Lord God, that you would cleanse my mouth and cleanse my heart uh, because it's filled with hate against Gabriel Franklin and Joe McCarthy for the sexual assaults, Lord God, that they have carried out against me in this apartment. Um, for the people that are constantly trespassing against me, discriminating against me because of my skin, my hair, my eyes, my color, my nationality, telling me that you didn't choose me as a minister, you didn't choose me as a child, and keeping me aloof, um, telling Melinda to tell me to stay out of their race and out of their family. Lord, I thought you delivered me from all of that. I thought you delivered me from the racism of this world, the racism of this uh, American uh, community. I thought I was free in Christ, and now I'm learning that um, even in, you know, these congregations are not necessarily yours. Some of them are the synagogues of Satan, and I will find uh, more unbelievers in these synagogues of Satan than I will find saints who have the Holy Spirit. And they say that I'm not, I don't have the Holy Spirit. They criticize me. They cut me down, and they don't want nothing to do with me. They just want me out the door. Um, I know that's not your spirit. I know that's not your heart. You died on that cross so that we can come in, not so that we could be kicked out. You died on the cross so that we could come in and fellowship with the saints. But the white Americans are God are discriminating, and they're making the issue their 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 elimination, and they're accusing us of wanting their elimination when it's them that's talking about their elimination 24/7, seven, seven days a week. It's not even us who's interested. And I don't believe that those men who sit there talking about their elimination, Lord God, are Christians. I believe that these people are unbelievers who want to who wanna point the finger and make an accusation so that we can remain outside of um, fellowshipping with them because they take pride in white uh, segregationist mentality. They take pride in uh, being white and segregated and separate, and that's fine. But as long as they're not calling this, themselves your church, and as long as they're not saying that they belong to the body, and that men should follow after them, and then only, only to discourage men and lead them to um, practice, uh, you know, the hate, the, only to lead their people to wearing the hood, uh, to practice hate, to practice homosexuality, and to practice homicide, um, and Lord, and, and just to practice, you know, the hanging of black men. And I could see them doing that, Lord God. Um, I could see that in these congregations, Lord God where they're a bunch of hooded men um, with hate in their hearts, um, with homosexuality in their soul, um, who, who, who want to kill us, you know, which is the homicide, and then hang us. I, I don't, I don't want to be a part of that kind of fellowship. I don't want to be uh, rubbing shoulders with those types of people, but I also don't want those people calling themselves Christians, Lord, um, because that is deceitful, because what is, what is inside of them is not the Christ. Um, what is inside of them? Is the devil and I pray like God against those people, against every single one of those congregations who uh, who consider themselves to be Christian, but yet they're not seeking holiness, they're not seeking godliness, they're not seeking sanctification, they're not seeking um, the unity of the faith. What they're seeking is the unity of the race. Uh, they're trying to uh, sort of like tell their race that it's okay to be a part, and they don't have to be born again, and they don't have to repent of those sins. And I don't agree with that. I mean, that's still the same mentality that is in the world, and they brought it into the household. They brought it into the fellowship. It's like Judas Iscariot bringing his buddies to the upper room, um, and and then completely coming out on them. And just like you made Judas let leave, I left not because I didn't believe, um, but because I do believe, and I don't agree with. It's, it's been reversed. It's now Judas and his buddies in the house, and all the disciples are outside. That's how I feel about the the European American churches that I go to, every single one of them, 
And I, I suspect that the African churches, the, the Asian churches, the Spanish churches, and any other churches, they're like that. They, they prefer the segregation of the races, but then they're not dealing with the salvation issue. So now it's Judas and his buddies that are in the house rather than the Christians who are filled with the Spirit and who love you and who want to serve you. They use your name Jesus, but it's just your name. It's not your spirit. It's not even the heart. Anyway, Father, I pray. Um, I pray for the children because they, they're being misled and they don't even realize that they're being misled by the racism of their families and the racism of, their, of the adults in their lives. Um, may you approach each one of them individually and give them your testimony and give them an opportunity to be saved because men like me cannot reach those children. We cannot reach those children for you because the racism is too steep inside of them. Anyway, Father, I pray for those who are listening or watching this video and ask that you will minister to them. And um, I don't know where they're at with the racism in this country. But Lord, I pray that you would work in the hearts of the American people um, to check themselves. Um, check themselves with your word. Check themselves at the door of any building that they go into, calling themselves the Christian faith. May you bless this uh, half hour of time, 15 minutes, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, some of you may not agree with my prayer, so um, this is probably a good time to just turn this off and move on. You know, go to somebody else that you you think are you know more European, perhaps. You know, uh, you know if, if if anything I say in this video makes you hiss, don't come back. Okay. If anything that I say in this video makes you want to lynch, break my neck, or even give that to me, don't come back. Don't come back. If there's no point. There's no point in you coming back and watching my videos and then wanting to hit me, hurt me, have Gabriel molest me, abuse me so you could be redeemed. I don't want to be in fellowship with you. I don't want to break bread with you. I don't want to be in association with you. I don't want you watching me. I don't like the way you think of me. I don't like the fact that you're looking at me and wanting to put a rope around my neck. I don't like the fact that you, you're you looking at me and you want to enclose me for some African woman. Okay? I don't want to be in no butt buddy relationship with you. So if you're, whatever your race is, if, if you're going to be offended by what I say in this video uh, concerning Peter or the, the, the issues that I address, now is a good time to leave. Because if you didn't like my prayer, you probably don't like my preaching. And if you don't like my preaching, you're probably not going to like anything else that I say. So, you know. Um, don't watch any more of my videos and just move on to another uh, pastor, leader, elder, whatever. There's a ton of them out there. You know, I'm trying to encourage you to move on so that you don't have to, you don't have to take this, this you know, it's like parents trying to force their kids to eat Brussels sprouts. Okay, you don't see me as a leader in the church. Now is the time to leave. Because there's no reason for you to remain. There's no reason for you to keep watching and listening and, 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 and cutting me down behind my back. Even though I can't hear you, yet I know you're watching and you're listening. You don't like Haitians being in this position, then now is the time to get. Okay? Because I'm not going to stop living for Christ because your white eyes are too white to, to see anybody else um, do the work in the ministry outside of your skin, hair, and eyes. So now is the time to go. All right? But as for you, those of you who are believers and who understand where I'm coming from, stay tuned. I'll read you the Word of God and, and, and give you my spiel. But for those of you who don't, how's the love you you won't see me on Grace Community Church property ever again. So it doesn't make a difference, right? And nobody from Grace should be even watching this, right? And if you stand with Grace, this isn't, this isn't for you. You stand with MacArthur, you stand with Franklin, this video is not for you. In any of my videos before this, in any of my videos after this, this video is not for you. You need to go. So there's nothing I can do. Because you don't agree with me being straight, you want me to be a homosexual, and I don't have time to sit here and cry every single video, and I can't do my job because I have to cry first. Anyway, as a form of review, um, as a form of review on November 4th, uh, basically I preached on uh, the third message out of 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 12, addressing the first group of, um, of the six groups that I've mentioned that I see in 1 Peter, in the text, in the epistle. Uh, remember that Peter is not writing to one church. He is writing to churches that are basically scattered throughout uh, Asia Minor in the provinces of Pontus, uh, where Aquila and Priscilla um, are, are from. They were the companions of Paul in Acts 18.2. Um, also Christians that are in Galatia. Uh, Galatia is the region where Paul and, and, and Barnabas were given the right hand of fellowship. If you remember, in, uh, Paul wrote about it in Galatians 2.9. 
and also to, to the churches in, in the regions of Cappadocia and Asia. Um, there were citizens of those, and, and basically Christians who were citizens of those cities were, were, were also present. Um, if you remember in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, when uh, the Spirit descended in Acts 2.9, um, so the Christians that Peter is writing to um, from Cappadocia in Asia, uh, probably some of those people might be uh, recipients of this letter. Um, uh, because when Paul, well, well actually when Peter had received um, the Holy Spirit with the others, um, after that they might have been there visiting um, Jerusalem and then went back up again and, and became a part of this uh, these different small church groups in the Asia Minor area and Cappadocia area. Um, and also he's writing to Christians that are from Bithynia. And basically Bithynia is the region where Paul in Acts 16, 7, remember, uh, was forbidden uh, to go into. There was a, 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 an area where he was allowed to go to, but there was also an area where he was forbidden not to go to. You read that in Acts 16, verse 7. Um, and perhaps it was because the Lord had called uh, Peter to that region, you know, the, the, the area where Paul was not allowed to minister to, Peter went to that region. Um, and remember there was Peter, James, and John, and then of course there was Paul. Now keep this in mind that Paul himself and John were called to do ministry in Asia Minor, um, having written their own epistles to various churches in various cities. Um, in Asia Minor, um, which is modern day Turkey, um, so Peter wrote two letters. This is a uh, this this is the first one here, um, containing five chapters, and and the second one, the second letter of Peter, contains three chapters. If you remember, Peter in this first letter, in chapter one, addresses uh, basically hope, holiness. Uh, he talks about trials, he warns, and he calls Christians to love. Right. So that was the first chapter. Then in chapter two, in this first letter, we have uh, so far looked at verses one to twelve. Peter addressing new Christians uh, and giving them um, instructions, you know, basically on how to contain themselves, how to respond to trials and tribulations and problems they're having. Um, in chapter 1, we see the new Christians uh, desire, uh, the new Christians are to have a desire for the Old Testament. He says, uh, because you are living stones, that's what Peter calls them, living stones, and believers, chosen, holy, um, and God's people receiving his mercy. Yeah, you know, this is just like a summary of verses one through ten out of the uh, chapter one, uh, out of chapter one, and in chapter two, verses eleven to twelve. To twelve, um, basically, in summary, um, Peter calls them uh, you, you loved Christians. You know, so you Christians that are loved. Um, basically, you're charged to refrain from lust, to be excellent, so that unbelievers do not slander, but give God glory unto the second coming of Christ. Overall, um, we are, um, we or they, are are, um, are to be called by God to be holy. We're called by God to be holy to stay away from sin, and to glorify God. Um, for today, that was a couple weeks ago when I had preached that message out of First Peter. Um, but today, we want to open our text to First Peter again and look at verses 13 to 25. Uh, coming from chapter 2, uh, we better remember that we are in a season of, um, when I had written the sermon, it was the season of Thanksgiving. Um, we're on the 24th of November, we will be celebrating Thanksgiving Day, but that following week, um, the, the computer had, the, the battery had broken, so we couldn't. Um, basically, Thanksgiving was a day of rest, gathering the family around the dinner table to give thanks to God uh, for everything that he's done. This past 2000 years, 16, I'm sure a lot of you did that. Um, keep in mind that the psalmist in the Old Testament had the right idea of giving God thanks. Um, when you wrote in uh, Psalms 111, verse 1, Praise the Lord, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart, in the, in the company of the upright and in the assembly. Uh, and then in verse 118.21, again the psalmist says, I shall give thanks to thee, for thou hast answered me in Thou hast become my salvation. So basically, I was trying to, uh, um, the word thanksgiving there, I, was, I looked it up in two different passages, Psalms 111, 1, and then Psalms 118, um, 21, where both times the, the psalmist says, 
I will give thanks to thee. I will give thanks to the Lord. And then again, when you look at Psalms 9 verse 1, he says, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of your wonders. So one of the things that we as Christians are called to do, uh, which Peter had called him to do um, also was to give thanks, right? To be thankful for everything. Um, but since it was Thanksgiving a couple weeks ago, I wanted to use those passages of scripture to make reference to Thanksgiving Day. But that didn't happen because of the fact that um, I had trouble with the computer and I couldn't bring it outside to record the messages. Um, we concluded last time um, that that um, we, we talked about the wonder of God. You know, it was a great wonder that God uh, could take a sinner like myself and turn him into a saint, transforming, you know, not just myself, but all Christians, right? He can take sinners like us and turn us into saints, transforming us from inside out, right? The Lord himself um, becomes our salvation, right, for all saints. And through Peter has called both first century and all century church leaders, right? All century church Christians calls all of us um, as saints to be saints in the 21st century, to be holy and excellent in our behavior among the unbelievers uh, in, in, you know, in that region back then and today. So the holiness of God, the call to God's holiness is not just for us um, then, but it's also for us now. I mean, God is calling us to be holy, to be set apart, right? To remove ourselves from the world, the attachment of the world, the things of the world, to think differently, to go in a different direction. Uh, to walk differently, to think differently, to see differently, to speak differently, to hear differently, to, to think differently. Um, taking all of the senses and making it um, Christ-centered and Christ-based. So our thoughts are, 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 are toward God. Our sight, set, you know, the scripture says, set your mind on the things above. Uh, fix your eyes on the things above. Speak the words. Um, you know, speak to God in prayer, praise God, um, and on our actions, it's not homicide, it's um, the Holy Spirit that's supposed to lead us to, to serve God, right? And with our heart, we're supposed to worship Him, right? We're supposed to worship Him and love Him. And so that all comes to be part of the holy life that God has called us. What we think, what we see, what we, what we speak, what we hear, what we think, right, in our minds, you know, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, your mind dwell on these things as a holy person, right? You're not supposed to be thinking about somebody's refuse. You're not supposed to be thinking about getting uh, getting busy with another person, right? Your mind is supposed to be different as a holy people. Um, so we give thanks to God, right? The, every holiday, not just Thanksgiving, but including Christmas and New Year's and all the holidays, right? We give thanks to God. All the holidays for God's power to transform salvation uh, in us to deliver uh, to deliver us from sin and the joy of being surrounded by others of like-minded faith in Christ. Wouldn't it be wonderful to walk into a church um, congregation and just be welcomed and to know that you have the love of love of God, right? And and the Scripture says, you know, they shall know it by our love, not by our hate or by the fact that we're wearing certain color clothing, communicating hate, communicating bloodshed, communicating communicating death rejection you know get out of my apart get out of my um church negro get out of my a congregation african person get, get get out of here go go somewhere else go to your own family go worship with your own people which is how i respond when i'm here in dealing with gabriel which is how i respond when i'm dealing with a woman who is forever molesting my flesh i respond that way toward her because of the sin that she's committing not because of the Christian faith that she's living. It's not her faith in Christ that I'm rebuking. It's her sin and the life of sin. What did God do to Sodom and Gomorrah? He annihilated them as a as a um, as a um, as a community, right? As two cities. Yesterday, I went to PSU to upload the video, you know, the two hours and seventeen minute video about the the building and the whole thing, right? Um, anyway, I won't take that out today. But bottom line is. As I, after I uploaded the video, I had downloaded, while well, I was trying to download the movie Noah, Noah's Ark, right? The, not the one by Russell Crowe, but another one. And what was really interesting is that at the beginning of the movie, 
what who came up to Abraham, uh, the person that came up to Noah was Lot right now when you read in Genesis the story of Lot doesn't come after until after the flood hundreds of years if not thousands of years after the flood in this version of Noah's Ark Lot was they gave the position of uh, they gave the position of Abraham to the, how do I explain this instead of Abraham having a nephew called Lot it was Noah who had a nephew called Lot or a friend called Lot and um, this friend called Lot had a wife okay and um, the same way God came and, and told the, it, it's almost like the whole story has been reversed so they took the they took Genesis 19 and put it before Genesis 6 so the whole story of Lot happened before Genesis 19 before Genesis 6 right the flood is 6 7 8 and 9 okay the story of Lot is not until Genesis 19 well in this version of it I don't know who the producer director was they took the story of Lot um, and instead of Lot having a relationship with Abram who was Abraham he had a relationship with Noah and Noah and his and his wife and his three sons but this Lot didn't have two daughters who slept with him it was just him and the whole um, they left Sodom and Gomorrah um, the, the woman turned around and she became a pillar of salt but there were no two daughters instead Lot became an aggressor and who stood against um, who stood against Noah um, who came out against him um, who was a friend of Noah's who came out against him uh, he eventually changed sides okay he never married he never had children uh, his, his daughters didn't give birth to children and um, he he lined himself with a bunch of uh, robbers killers whatever and uh, when Noah was in the ark he and this and, and these groups of men came together to take over the ark okay, I, I don't know where they got the story from but all I know it was really very interesting very interesting just the way they just switched it I'm like okay I don't know but um, I'm not sure why they did it that way um, when I watched the other Noah's Ark, it's, it's the, 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 the sons, one of the, one of the daughters, one of the sons married a daughter, and she had twins, and the two girls, and they were, I don't know, Americans are doing some really funky things with the, with the scriptures. I, I'm not sure where they're getting it from. I don't know uh, where they're getting that kind of liberty, but you Christians better be very careful with what you watch out there. The movies, if they don't match the word, I would be very careful. Um, if they're changing, if they're changing the, the wording of scripture, and now they're changing the chronology of scripture, you better be careful. That's what I'm saying. I'm not adding any more to it or taking any any more from it. All I'm saying is, Christians, be careful because the devil is after you. And the love of the love of God, just like it says in Timothy, is cold as ice. And those big name leaders. They're, they're devils. They're snakes. Watch out for those boys. Um, they're devils. They are devils. I don't know how else to explain to you. I can't give you names, um, except for the one that I'm dealing with, MacArthur. But apart from that, they're all they're all devils. Uh, um, doesn't matter what shade you put on them. I would, I would I would caution you to be very careful. Anyway, enough about that. That's my little warning. You know, it's. I. Anyway, for this week though you know um, December 2016 uh, Peter basically continues in verses 13 through 17 um, talking to the to the first group and remember the first group I made mention of were basically it, it's almost like he's addressing young Christians right he's addressing you Christians young Christians remember in chapter 2 he says therefore putting aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn babes he's comparing those Christians right uh, the, the who have just found faith in Christ saying, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the Lord he's encouraging them and he's charging them it's like you need to desire the word of God right uh, that by it you may grow in respect to, to salvation so that if you read the scriptures you believe the scriptures you will grow in respect to your salvation you will have a new understanding of who God is and who you are in God and in Christ right he says to them if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord at salvation if you have tasted it you need to long for the pure milk of the word he said and coming to him um, as to a living stone rejected by men but choice and precious in the sight of God okay um, 
you also as living stones are being built up as a, a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ for this is contained in scripture verse 6 behold I lay in Zion a choice stone a precious cornerstone and he who believes in him shall not be disappointed so Jesus is called a cornerstone the Christians are called living stones okay living stones this this precious verse 7 this precious value then is for you who believe but for those who uh, disbelieve the stone which the builders rejected this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense um, for they became for they stumbled because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom they were also appointed but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation of people from God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of, the, out of darkness into the marvelous light uh, for you once were not a people but now you are the people of God uh, you have not received mercy but now you have received mercy so he's sort of like reminding them both as Jews um, and as Gentiles that you were not his but now you are his you were not holy but now you are holy you are not chosen but now you are chosen you were not a priestly people but you are a priestly people uh, you are not a holy nation but you are a holy nation now you are a, a God's people God's own possession he is so it, it's sort of like you were you were outcast and rejected but now you have been received because of Christ so Christ makes a difference that thing right there once you cling to the name of Jesus and you, you are his he is the bridge right so he's the bridge and when I come to you with the gospel I'm saying here I'm holding on to his hand give me your hand give me your hand give me your hand give me your hand so that you could be saved come on I'm holding on to Jesus give me your hand give me your hand you, 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 you've ever had um you know somebody falls somewhere and you form a line right one person holds my hand and and I'm holding and I'm holding my hands out and so like, come on come on over to cross over so you could be saved out of that situation right come on over come on over here i'm moving on to the name of jesus paul says follow me as i follow christ right paul says come to me come to me and i'm holding on to jesus and salvation happens that's why when i'm always out there preaching the gospel that's what you don't see you see the bible um that's me holding on to jesus and i'm saying come and i'll pray with you right i'll pray with you i'll pray for you and i'll pray with you and people say, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to come over to where you're at because you don't have the Holy Spirit. Oh, I'm not coming over to where you're at because you don't have a building. Or you're not, you're not a white guy. Okay, okay, no. Whoever said that, you know, I don't know. But in any case, let's get back to the Word of God. Verse 11 says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers, right? Um, as foreigners, right? Belonging to another country, another community, another faith. As aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust. I urge you as... I'm, I'm urging you as if you are aliens, as if you are strangers, as if you don't know the covenant of God, as if you don't know uh, the person of Christ. And I'm saying to you, um, as, 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 as foreigners and strangers, abstain, right? As, as strangers to the covenant of promise, as, as strangers. He says, strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, right? Don't do that. Um, which rage war against the soul, right? It says, keep your behavior what? Excellent. Among the Gentiles. So that, in, and why does he call them Gentiles? Gentiles are the nations, the unbelievers, right? He's talking to Jews, but he's also talking to Christians, right? So that in the things they slander you as evil doers, they may on account of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation, in the day of his second coming. So, but that was a couple weeks ago. Now today we continue with Peter, right? And Peter says, um, and taking... Still talking to newborns in Christ, right? Verses 13 on, he, he says to them, submit yourself. After he's told them to, um, after he's told them to, going back to verse 2, after he tells them to, to long for the pure milk of the word, um, because they tasted the kindness of the Lord. After he has told them and he has reminded them um, to abstain from fleshly lust, and he, he's told them to keep their behavior uh, excellent among the Gentiles, because of the um, the slandering of evildoers and the slandering of, of Gentiles, unbelievers, right? He says to them, um, you, same group, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the, punish for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men, Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, 
but use it as bond, bond slaves of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Wow. Okay. Talking to the same group. He says to them, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. In summary, summarizing verses 13 through 17, um, Christians are exhorted to submit to authority, to act as, as free men, to, um, at God's bond servants, at God's bond slaves, honor all, love the church, fear God, and honor authority. That's a mouthful. But he's talking to those Christians, and he's talking to five different regions where those Christians are under Roman authority. And those Christians are also not only under Roman authority, but they're also under God, and they're under Christ. And that region, that area has not been, um, maybe it has by Paul and some other apostles, but it hasn't been evangelized right and, and and probably with all these Christians it probably has but these are the instructions for those who are new for those who may be young in Christ and he's talking to them that way for them to longing for the pure milk of the word to stay away from sin and now he says you need to submit for the Lord's sake not for your sake but for the one who you call Messiah remember what he says in, in, in verse 8 he, he says though you have not seen him the Lord you love him the Lord and though you do not see him now the Lord but believe in him who the Lord you greatly rejoice uh, with joy inexpressible and full of glory okay so you're expressing um, joy for the fact that you know the Lord you understand the Lord and you you honor the Lord uh, you need to live a holy life toward the Lord everything goes back to who the Lord so in verse 13 he says for the Lord's sake, so everything you do now, whatever you do, do your work heartily as unto the Lord rather than for men, right? Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Everything you do is for the Lord, church. Lord, 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 Jesus, Lord, Jesus, Lord, Jesus, Lord, Jesus, Lord, Jesus, Lord, Jesus, hallelujah, praise Jesus, Jesus, Lord, 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 Jesus, ha, 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 let the whole Jesus, we love you. Yeah. That's what he's trying to say. So he says, look, submit yourself for the Lord's sake. Not for my sake, not for their sake, for his sake, for the baby in the manger's sake, right? For the, the father, the son, the Holy Spirit, the birthday, the child, of, yeah. right? So, <laughs> for the Lord's sake, he said, submit yourselves to, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution. How many different human institutions are out there? Oh, man. I started studying this, and I thought, oh, my God, how am I going to relate this? How am I going to explain this to these people? How many different human institutions have there been, right? Back in the days, I mean, just the empire itself, outside of the empire, the nations above, the nations beneath, the nations around, I mean, right? Those that are rich, those that are poor, I mean, human institutions galore, right? Just reading through scripture, and then he gives you one, he gives you one institution, what? King, whether, at, whether to a king as one in authority, or here's another one, to a governor, Right, one right below the king, or to a governor as sent by the king for the what for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. He gives you the position, one under the position, and then for what's the purpose for the punishment of evildoers or the praise of those who do right. And what does scripture say in Romans? Right, when you read Paul's letters, Paul says this about authority, uh, human institutions. In Romans one, he says actually. Romans 1, Romans 13, he says this, Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by Him. And he says, Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. So this is Paul writing in Romans 13, 1 and 2. So Paul and Peter, they saw eye to eye, you know? Paul and Peter saw eye to eye and, and when it comes to dealing with human authority. Why? It was for the Lord's sake. In other words, don't dishonor me by dishonoring this king, president, uh, governor, mayor, police department, chief officer, blah, 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 you know. Submit to them for his sake. Not for your own sake, but I'll, I'll serve, I'll serve, okay, for the Lord. Whatever you do, you do it for the Lord. Okay, so we'll submit for what? For the Lord. Because, why? Because we don't want to dishonor his name. So, let's get real quick here. So the scripture says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Why? Because he's behind all the institutions. He's, beside, he's behind authority, right? Whether to a king as the one in authority or to the governor um, as one sent by the king for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise. And then he says in verse 15, for such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. When you do what is right and submit to the king, you're going to silence a bunch of critics, okay? 
Um, and then verse, let's see here. And verse 16, he says, act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil. Right? Act as free men. In other words, you're free in Christ. Right? You don't have no holds bound. Right? You don't have chains on your hands and feet. Right? He says, but act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil. Do not use your freedom as a covering for evil. Don't, don't go out there and do... Hmm, how do I explain it? Do not... Do not use the freedom that you have in Christ to become all things to all men. Um, and then for the purpose of covering up the evil intentions that is in your heart and mind. In other words, don't say, I, I, can be, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but then have evil intention behind that. In other words, your own personal agenda, right? If it's for the Lord, then do it for the Lord. But if you have a personal agenda, God is going to bring that forth. Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira uh, submitted to Peter, but um, they used that freedom for what purpose? To cover up something. What was it that they're covering up? The other portion of the money, right? So in um, Acts, I think it's like Acts 5, or Acts, I think it's Acts 5? I'm going to let's look it up real quick here. So the whole story of Ananias and Sapphira, right? Acts 5, I think it was. Um, the scriptures tells us that, or Acts Hold on. Yeah, An Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira. So the, the, the scripture says here, act as free men, as free people in Christ. They were giving, right? But then what did they do? They used their freedom to cover up something that was evil. What was it that was evil? The, the, the deception. The deception that it wasn't all of the money, it was only half of the money. Okay? Um... It's here in my Bible. So that, um, once you hate that when your pen all of a sudden loses, um, loses ink and you can't write in it, Acts 5. Okay, so, but use it, he says, um, do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but, he says, but use it, use your freedom as a bond slave of God. How many times did Paul call himself a bond slave of God? And every every time he he wrote a letter, right? Every time he wrote a letter, he begins the letter by saying, "A bond ser Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints. Bond servant of Christ Jesus to all the saints." I mean, practically every letter that he wrote, he called himself what? A bond servant. He was attached. He wasn't getting paid for the work that he did, right? He wasn't getting paid for the work that he did. So he was a bond servant, a bond slave. Um, of Christ and of God. And then in verse 17 he says, honor all men, love the brotherhood. What does he mean by honor all men? Honor all men. Sub What's the difference between the submission to all, uh, to all submission to every human institution and the honoring of all men? Can we actually honor all people? Some people really take this off, don't they? Some people really make us angry. Can you honor every man? There was a man in Christ Jesus at one time who I felt was getting too much recognition he was getting more recognition than the name of jesus and i couldn't honor him because of the attitude and the spirit that was behind it. that spirit and that attitude was not something that i could honor that i could respect that i could uh, look up to um that i could follow because i felt like he was getting more more he was getting more recognition than christ himself in other words the glory that belonged to god so like satan you know satan wanted to be exalted, the exaltation that belongs to God. Scripture tells us to exalt God, you know, worship God. And yet here is this man who was presenting himself that way, and I couldn't attach myself to him, nor could I be drawn to his leadership and his example, because it wasn't, it's like it wasn't honorable. It was a dishonorable thing that I felt like he was doing with his heart, and what they were doing, you know, for him at that time. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I should have given him the honor, but... You know, I don't know. But the scripture says, honor all men. If you can't honor them on a high level, at least honor them as the image of God. At least honor them as the fact that they're brothers in Adam. At least honor them as the fact that they're sinners, just like you who are in need of salvation. Right? And so you become all things to them. Uh, and you honor them with, with, with the context in which God has uh, put all men in, in the context of scripture. Right? Where we're all fallen sinners. All of us like sheep have gone astray. You may not be able to honor them with a crown on their head, but you can... 
you know, at least take it with a grain of salt. I have a hard time with that, uh, that work because a lot of people do wrong against me because they want me to be their subordinates. So that makes it difficult for me to constantly uh, honor them when they're dishonoring me. If you can't honor someone, pray and ask God to forgive you and then move on. You know, maybe later on in life he'll give you an opportunity um, to, to, you know, restore the person or to honor someone else. You know that can, uh, or to honor someone else that can, that can redeem you out of that situation. Um, the scripture says, "Love the brotherhood." Um, I think you know what love is, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. Um, Paul talks about it in First Corinthians 13. There's that whole list there. It says, "Fear God." I don't think I need to explain to you what it means to fear God, right? Um, you you fear serpents, right? You wouldn't put your hands in a in a in a fishbowl where there's a snake. And you'd be like, no, I don't want to mess with that because if I do, I'm going to get bitten. Well, the Lord is not a serpent, but you know that He is holy. And um, many times in Scripture, you will find that when you dishonor the holiness of God and the honor of God, He will bite you like a serpent. Right? When An when Ananias and Sapphira did not honor Him, and they did not, not honor the Holy Spirit's presence in them and in the church, what happened? He struck them down, and they died. When the Jews uh, in the Old Testament began to worship. Uh, idols, they did not honor him. What did he do to them? He sent them serpents in the wilderness and he took their lives and then he gave them 70 years of captivity. Right? So when you don't honor God um, and, and, and fear him, the begin I think it's Solomon who says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So if you don't show God that you're, you're afraid of him or you fear him or you know you fear his presence. In other words, you know me from within. Right? You know me from within. You know everything that I am. You know everything that I think, which is I think that's more or less in line with what, um, you know, what David was saying. You know, when you fear God, acknowledge the fact that he is there and he knows you inside and out, right? And he knows everything that there is to know about you. So it, it, it's not like he's not here just because you don't see him. That's why at the very beginning, what, what did Peter say? Even though you do not see him, yet you, want, you love him or you fear him, you believe in him, you rejoice. In other words, you acknowledge the fact that he's there. Christians, fear the Lord. Keep fearing him. Um, keep acknowledging him. Stay in that. Stay in that um, line of thinking, right? He says, "Honor the king," right? Not just honor the king because he wears a crown and he he has been given the authority of the state, but honor the king because he rep he is an agent of God, right? He is an agent of God and he has been put there by God for that purpose. He's the emperor. He's the exalted one because God chose him and to put him on that seat of authority. That is God's seat of authority, but he's choosing to put that man there as a representative. So whatever you have to say to that man, you're saying to God. So respect the authority and respect all men because all men are the image of God. Right? So that's why uh, Jesus says to, the, um, to Saul, 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 why are you uh, kicking me? Why are you kicking against the goats? Like, what? Who are you, Lord? He says, it's me, Jesus. You're hitting me. What? Why? Why are you? You didn't honor my church. If you're hitting them, you're hitting me. So anyway, we're going to move now to um, verses 18 to 25. And in verse 18 to 25, I want to read that real quickly here. It says, servants, be submissive to your masters. Right? Let me summarize this first of all, verses 18 to 25. Uh, basically, Christian, Christian servants, um, uh, Christian servants, they need to submit to good and evil masters. I think in summary, this is what uh, Peter is saying here. Uh, they need to submit to good masters and evil masters. This is this is their calling, even under harsh treatment. And Christ um, is your example. Uh, basically, follow His example. You know whether they're good masters or evil masters. Sort of like Rahab, not Rahab the harlot, but Hagar, who was Abraham's servant. She took off running when she was mistreated by um, um, Hagar. Took off running when she was mistreated by Sarai or Sarah, and when she took off running. Um, the angel of the Lord came to her and said to her, you're, you're going to have a child. His name is going to be Ishmael. He's going to be a brute of a man. And he's going to be a, 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 he's going to have 12 sons and a tribe. And uh, he's going to have all that. However, you need to go back to your, to your, to your uh, mistress. Okay. And have the child there so that his father can acknowledge him, which is Abraham. Um, and so in, in here in the New Testament, Christians are being um, encouraged, right? So the second group, which are the servants, now, not just the new saints, but the servants, he says to them, Peter says to them, you Christians of Asia Minor, you, you servants, you Christians who are servants in Asia Minor, you need to submit to your masters with all respect. I mean, if you have come to Christ while you're a servant, remain in that position because, you know, you're probably getting paid for the job, right? He says, uh, submit to your masters with all respect, 
not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. So there might be some people who are, you know, buttheads, you know, a bunch of buttheads whom you don't want to be, you wouldn't, whom you don't want to, excuse me, whom you don't want to serve or be in association with as a result of their maltreatment, right? Verse 19, he says, for this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God, a man bears up under sorrow when suffering unjustly. So again, bring it up to who? Bring it up to God. He says, for conscience sake, toward God. In other words, when you serve, you serve the Lord. Whatever you do, you do it for the Lord. So even these knuckleheaded people, you know, bring them to the, bring them, if you're, if you're working for somebody who is uh, a knucklehead and who does not understand that you're a Christian and you're a believer, bring their name up to Christ. Bring their name up to the Lord and pray for their salvation so that they could repent of their sins. Um, so a man bears up under sorrow when, when, when suffering unjustly, meaning that, you know, you, you stick with it even when this, this master or this boss or this, this leader in your church or whoever it is that treats you like a dog. You know, you stay, you stick with the, with, the, with the Christian faith and you don't turn away and you don't turn against the position, right? You may pray for the person's repentance, but the position is, you know, the position is to, to remain respectable, respect the fact that they're your boss, right? Um, verse 20 says, For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience, right? Um, but, but, here it is, but if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Listen to this, verse 20 says, For what credit is there? What's the credit if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience, right? When you, the Christian, sin and you are harshly treated, you endure it with patience. Right, you you endure it because you know you did wrong, but when you do what is right, in other words, you prayed like Daniel prayed, or or you you rejected the idol like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, and suffer for it. Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in a fiery furnace. For you you suffer for it patiently. You endure it. This finds favor with God. So it's not when you do wrong, uh, crime equals punishment, but prayer equals punishment. So Daniel prays, he gets punished, he gets thrown into the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego rejects the, 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 top, the idol, and they get thrown into a fiery furnace. This finds favor with God. God will appear in the fiery furnace. God will appear in the, in the lion's den. Verse 21, for you have been uh, called for this purpose, right? Verse 21 says, for you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow, you have been called for what purpose? To do what? To do what is right. And then when suffering comes, you endure what is right. No matter what, you keep doing what is right, even when suffering comes. So no matter what, right? And he says, for, verse 21, for you have been called for this. That was the purpose why you were called. That was the reason is for you to stick to the Christian faith, no matter what. Right? It says, since Christ also suffered for you, right? Christ was doing right. He was preaching, he was healing, he was teaching, he was raising the dead. He was calling them to salvation, giving them the Holy Spirit, forgiving them of their sin. And what happened? He was crucified. That was the example he left for you to follow in his steps. Now, go and do the same. Verse 22, who committed no sin, right? Nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled by those people accusing him in front of Pilate and in front of um the, the, the other governors and, and uh, Pharisees and whatnot, while he was being reviled. What did, what did this, verse 20 say? He did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. Come down from the cross, you, 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 you imposter. Come down from the cross. Right? He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Father, forgive them, for they not know what they are doing. Right? Verse 24, and he himself, that is the Christ, whom they cannot see, whom they, whom, they, whom they do not know, says, for he himself bore our sin in his body on the cross, right? That we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds, what? You are healed. By his wounds, those, those, this can hear, can you believe in it? Hebrews, uh, not, Hebrews uh, 9, I think it is, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin, sin, right? So because of the blood that he had shed, the scripture says, by his wounds, you are healed, you are forgiven. And verse 25, he says, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. As, as Jews and as Gentiles, you are doing your own thing. But now, 
that you have come to salvation, you were straying away, but now you have returned to what? To the shepherd. He is the good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for his sheep, and the guardian of what? And the guardian of your soul. Um, this is basically what Peter is communicating to the church in Asia Minor. And he's encouraging now servants. He's encouraging new Christians. Um, and the next chapter, chapter 3, he's going to be encouraging uh, wives. He's going to be encouraging husbands. And he's going to be encouraging others that are in the church, in that region, in that area. Um, basically, in conclusion, you understand what, what Peter is saying now in the entire second chapter. He's talking to both groups of, of Christians. Um, I guess in summary, you can just say that Christians are exhorted, especially in, in verses 13 to 25, Christians are exhorted and encouraged to desire the Old Testament scriptures, to know their new identity as living stones. Uh, basically, they are cautioned to refrain from sin, right? Uh, abstain from fleshly lusts, uh, but they are encouraged to submit to authority, to submit to, to good and evil masters, and to remember Christ's example, and to follow it. That's fine. Father, thank you for this hour, uh, for this opportunity to share the gospel and to share with the people. I pray that you would work in the heart of all men, and especially those who are watching this video. In Jesus' name, amen.